Okay, so it looks like we are ready to start now. So hello everyone and welcome to this event on our online pollution and environmental control course. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. We're really pleased to have you here and I'm happy to see some familiar names and some less familiar names. So it's quite nice to see people at a different stage of the registration program process here. So if you are considering studying pollution and environmental control with us online, this event is an excellent opportunity to have an, a tester lecture, learn more about this course and have any questions answered. So feel free to use the Q&A function or the chat box uh, and interact with us. If you are watching the recording back, I know that some people expressed uh, interest in joining us today, but were unable to do so. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at studyonline at manchester.ac.uk. You can see the email address at the bottom of the screen here. So we are going to start off with some introductions uh, from myself and from our course director. While we do that, I invite you to add a message to the chat and let us know who you are and where you're coming from. So it gives us an idea of the audience. So my name is Xavier. I'm one of the course advisors here uh, uh, at the, the University of Manchester, and I'm here to make your, deci your decision to study at the University of Manchester as straightforward as possible. I'm here to guide you through the application process and answer any question that you might have. So you can contact me anytime by email and we can arrange a one-to-one -one consultation on Zoom or over the phone to discuss the course further. So don't hesitate to email me, I'll be very happy to help. So today I'm, I will be mainly facilitating the webinar and I'm very pleased to be joined by Andrew Lowe, our course director. Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself and give our audience more background on your career and academic interest maybe? Sure, yeah. So yes, I'm Andy Lowe. I'm um, a lecturer, a senior lecturer here at Manchester University. Um, I've been teaching part-time at the university for 15 years and now full-time for nearly four years now. But in my previous life, I was a, spent 20 years uh, in industry, uh, working all over the world, including Pakistan. I just saw it flash up, uh, Fatima, welcome. Uh, and uh, working on um, water resource type projects, irrigation projects, um, hydrology projects, and, I'm, and flood forecasting type projects. And I try and bring these, my, my work experience, uh, project uh, experience to the, to the coursework that I, that I teach on the course. So welcome. I look forward to uh, speaking with you. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. So let's have a quick look at the agenda for today. So uh, we've done the introduction. So now uh, Andrew will first give us a, a short mm -hmm. test lecture on the crucial role of water resource modeling to safeguard food security in the Rift Valley in Ethiopia. He will then speak about what you can expect from uh, this online masters in pollution and environmental control course. And finally, we will open things up to a Q&A. So I encourage you to ask any questions about the course. Please use the Q&A function or the chat box. Any question is valuable for everyone, so don't be afraid. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Andrew and I will just first give you the uh, control. Andrew, and you have the control now, Andrew. Okay, let me just check. Okay, I'll see if this slide works, but uh, welcome. So yes, I want to talk to you about some work I, I undertook in Ethiopia, and it's looking at the saline lakes, alkaline lakes and the Rift Valley and, and how we can use computer modeling to help us safeguard food security. Uh, just move to the next slide. Just one second. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so this is some work I, I did in Ethiopia. We were working um, with the Ethiopian government and some local uh, companies in Ethiopia and a consulting firm here in the UK, where we were looking at uh, how we could use water resource planning and water resource modeling to um, help policymakers provide um, uh, policies related to improving water security, food security, and en energy security. And in the Rift Valley, 
uh, water stress is a real impact, has a real impact and hinders economic development. So we're going to talk today about food security and water management. Okay, just to give you an idea of where we are, I can uh, uh, put on the pointer just one second. So we can possibly see this is Ethiopia. And we're going to talk today about my work on computer modeling in the Rift Valley here, this, this red basin located there. And you can spot some of the, the key lakes, a number of uh, lakes that uh, form part of the Rift Valley. So approximately uh, 10 million people live in the Rift Valley. This population is increasing, will double in the next 20 years. And many people are uh, subsistence farmers, so they rely, rely on rain-fed agriculture. So they're susceptible to climate change and changes in, in rainfall patterns. And at the moment, per capita, per person, there's about 600 meters cubed per, per year for individuals available. So that's considered water, water scarce by the UN. By 2035, so not far away, that will halve and individuals' availability to water will decrease uh, considerably. So it's extremely water scarce uh, environment. So it, it's, uh, it makes people very susceptible for food insecurity. And again, we can see on that, that image on the, on the slide, there are a number of lakes that are in the Rift Valley in, in, uh, in the southern Ethiopia. So uh, there is water available, but we want to talk about how we can better management, and we, we need to uh, discuss how we can do that. So let's look at those lakes a little bit uh, closer. So we kind of think of, from that image, we can see that there are a lot of lakes in the Rift Valley. So we might think it's water rich, but it's not because many of those lakes that we can see are alkaline, saline, so very sodic lakes. Lakes, and we'll talk about the water quality of that in a few slides time. So they're very uh, fragile ecosystems. They support a lot of bird life, and they're in decline. So over the last 30, 40 years, we've been monitoring them, and we can see they're declining with uh, with the changing climate, but also with the increase in abstraction by people to supply water for irrigation, for food security, and for people's uh, daily use. So they are in decline. And we can see on this slide, hopefully, these are some of the images. This is uh, Lake Abiata. You see the salt crusts. So they're very sodic and alkaline lakes. And here there's some hot springs that form around some of these lakes. And in the south of the Rift Valley, we've got Lake Charmo, which is one of the... Uh, uh, ha has a lot of large Nile crocodiles in it. You can see through time how the shoreline has changed over the last uh, couple of decades. So uh, the Rift Valley has lots of lakes, but they're very sodic, alkaline, and they're in decline. So they're really fragile ecosystems. Okay, sorry, I'm not quite getting through my slides too well. But here we're going to focus on the northern lake. So in this talk, I want to talk about food security and water resource modeling for these northern lakes. And you can see them on this slide here. Lakes Y is very important. This is one of the only freshwater lakes that's available to people in the north, the, the catchment. So that can be used directly for irrigation and water use. These other lakes are more sodic, alkaline, so they're more problematic. and there's quite a complex hydrology related to this, this catchment. We have mountains in the, the, the uh, east and west of the, the catchment that feed into these lakes. And Lakes Y is connected by a river called the Bolbora River to Lake Abiata, which is very famous for its flamingos. So what if we have impacts in Lakes Y, we have, we have dramatic impacts in this very shallow lake called Abiata. And we can see some photographs of Lake Langano here. And this is uh, you know, pristine lake, lots of wildlife, lots of hippo hippopotamuses, and a really good ecotourism for um, uh, Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopian tourists coming from Addis Ababa, the capital north of here, and also for international tourists as well. So it's a bird, a, a bird wildlife sanctuary. So really sensitive ecosystems. And we can see, look at that, uh, some of the facts I've already talked about. So Lakes Y is a freshwater lake. 
we, we use it for irrigation. It's important for growing flowers that, um, that are exported to the European markets. It's important for local communities for their fisheries. So it's fresh water. The other lakes are highly saline. We can see in that table on this slide, the, uh, the different water quality ind indices, because the very high EC, electrical conductivity values, it's very alkaline. So Lake Shala, which is a very deep volcanic lake, Lake Abiata, these are bird sanctuaries, real national parks. And we can see in the slides here, some of the, the uh, pelicans and the flamingos that are, that's, um, that thrive in these environments. So these lakes are really important to be protected. And Lake Abiata is a very shallow lake and is very vulnerable to, to changes in that river that connects to Lake Owasa, uh, sorry, to Lakes Y. And it's been declining since 1972. We can see it's declining rapidly um, through the last decades. Okay, so uh, why is that important? Well, the, these lakes are important to, to provide um, uh, uh, fish to the local communities, water for irrigation for local farmers and their families, but also to the flower industry to export for income for the government. However, the, uh, there is a plan or there has been a plan to try and ex uh, to expand the irrigation for food security within the Rift Valley. So there's been proposals to, to increase irrigation areas, new irrigation to approximately 50,000 hectares, 49,000 hectares of new irrigation. Now that requires water coming from the rivers that feed into those lakes. So we need to understand, can those lakes support that amount of irrigation? The rivers entering into the lake, are gonna take water out of those and grow food crops. You know, what, what, is, what is the impact on those lakes? What's the impact on the health of those lakes and on the environment? And we can do that by using modeling techniques. So the course that we teach here at Manchester focuses quite a lot on data, data analysis, but I teach a lot of modeling and I try and use real world examples to do that. And this is one of them. And I teach about water balance modeling. So we can investigate this issue of, can we maintain the health of lakes if we introduce new irrigation to the Rift Valley by using a water balance model? So let's, let's look at what a water balance model looks like. Well, let's first talk about data that goes into our water resource model or water balance model. So we've got, uh, we need uh, to measure uh, climate. So we can see our climate station here. We, we have rainfall. So we need rainfall inputs into our water resource model. We can, we need to calibrate those models to lake water level. So we measure lake levels and then we can measure flow and the water, water level in our rivers in order to input those, those data sets into the computer models. And you'll learn about how we collect data on the course, how we interpolate point rainfall using GIS spatial analyst techniques interpolation. And you'll learn about uh, different types of modeling, including water resource modeling. So those are the inputs. We also need to understand the, the shape of the lake, the volume of the lake, the surface area of our lakes. So you can see Lake Abiata, Lake Shala, Lake Langano. So we need, to, we need to put into the computer models the shape, depth, and the bathymetry of the, the lakes. And we did that by undertaking some lake surveys, bathymetric surveys. We have our, our boat with our team working uh, um, driving the boat up and down the lakes, recording depth using this uh, acoustic sounder. And we're able to then provide the bathymetry of the lake. So the kind of the depth contours of, of each of the lakes. Once we have that, we can put that in our computer models and that also helps us model it. So for, let's go back. So if we're looking now at this lake here, Lake Shala, which is an extinct volcano, one of the deepest in Africa. We did our measurements, we did some bathymetric surveys, and we can see the results here. So we can see the contour showing the, the depth of, or the, the changing depth of Lake Shala um, there. And we've got that in 3D here, and it's like a saucepan, very deep here. This is the, 
This is a volcano, and this is a shallower area here. And once we have this information, we take it, we produce some plots showing the, how, how depth, how volume changes with depth. We enter that into our water balance model, and we're able to then predict water level by putting input rainfall and input flows into the model. So we need accurate um, bathymetry of lakes to, to, to have an accurate water resource model. So again, let's just quickly look at the, uh, the model. So that's what the, the model for the northern lakes looks like. So we're using a software called WEEP here. So that's the interface here. It's got a GIS interface. We've got our Lake uh, Zwei, Lake Shala is the one we were just looking at. Got all our rivers entering into the lakes. We've got our irrigation areas, our proposed irrigation areas, and our red dots are the, the water supply to the local towns. So the water balance model is like a bank account. It's uh, determining what goes into the model, the inputs, and then it determines the outputs to the to evaporation, to irrigation farms, to water supply. And the accounting system then determines what the flow in the rivers are and what the, the lake levels are as well. So that's what the model looks like. Then we, we again, that's what it looks like, but we put into the model monthly data we simulate a 30 year period. So let's do that. We've got our results here. So for, for, for a 30 year period, we can see the, the model results in blue for the different lakes compared to the red observed lake level data. So we can, we're can we calibrating the model to lake levels. We can say for lakes Y, we've got a, a pretty good fit against the red observed lake levels over that 30 year period. Same for Lake Langano, where the, the bird sanctuaries are, the ecotourists are. That's pretty good. And Lake Abiata, where the flamingos are, it's not bad calibration. So we're calibrating our model so that it can replicate reality. So those results are looking pretty good to me. Then we, once we've got a calibrated model, we can then start asking the model some questions. So we can ask what happens if... So we can look at these lakes and say, what happens if we, we, we expand the existing irrigation by 38 or 40,000 square, sorry, 40,000 hectares? So let's look. So we run the model, we set the model up with additional irrigation area. So we look at these, these three lakes and we can look at the results. So lakes Y we can see here. So if we put in a total of 38,000, nearly 39,000 hectares, then lakes Y, the, the area reduces by 24%. Lake Abiata, where the flamingos live, very sensitive to what happens in Lake Zwei, we get a 1.5 meter drop in, in long-term average annual lake levels, 21% reduction in lake area and so on. And in, if we put in, we can set the model up to replicate climate change. Again, we can see the significant impact on these lake areas. So again, with this amount of irrigation plus climate change, we're reducing lake area for lakes Y by 32% and Lake Abiata by 31%. So we can use the model to, to, to tell us what the impact is. So that will inf, um, influence and um, affect policy making. So let's, let's think about sustainable agriculture. We can also say, okay, so what can we grow? We've got a growing population, a grow, uh, we've got food insecurity, so we need to provide some additional irrigation to sustain food security. So let's, so we set up the model again, and we start inputting different levels of irrigation. So I've, I've put in something more reasonable. This is taking a lot of iter iterations, but if we put in 6,250 hectares, and spread it between the lakes, 5,500 around the freshwater lake here, nothing around Ebiata, and only 750 hectares around Lake Langano, then we get a 1% reduction in lake area in, in uh, Lake Swai, uh, a larger reduction in Abiata, but it's less impact than the planned amount of irrigation. Again, we can set up the climate change, and again, we can see the impacts. If we, if we only irrigate 6,250 hectares, we're reducing the lake levels by 10 centimetres and reducing it by 2.1%. So we can use computer models to help 
uh, government uh, policymakers decide on what they think is a su sustainable irrigation in these catchments. No irrigation is best because uh, any, any irrigation you, you support will reduce and have an impact on lake levels. But the models have been used to try and advise governments on what, what they can and cannot do in, in these basins. So the advice to the government was uh, uh, keep, it, keep it to a minimum to 6,250 hectares. Okay, so very quickly, so uh, the results from this study, well, we uh, large scale irrigation should be limited, so it's potential for large impacts on lakes. We need to limit the, the abstraction from the freshwater lakes, lakes wide to protect the Lake Abiata, where the, which is very shallow, very sodic, it's where the flamingos um, breed. So we, in the future, we need to be very careful about e evaluating new proposals for irrigation. We need to choose irrigation technology that's efficient, and we need to manage uh, the impacts of any impacts on the lakes. We need to manage that with the local communities. So very quickly, uh, we need uh, economic development in the Rift Valley to help to reduce poverty and increase uh, people's incomes. Water is the main constraint uh, to economic development and food security. Irrigation poses uh, the largest demand of water, so it should be minimized. Um, water resource modeling can help us decide policies related to food security, water management, and we need to be careful. We advise policymakers to restrict any uncontrolled expansion of irrigation. And if you're interested, these are some of the, the, uh, the papers that came from that work. So that's been a very whistle-stop tour to uh, the Rift Valley and the importance of water resource modeling and how to optimize uh, food security by advising governments on the level of irrigation that, they, that the Rift Valley can support. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, would you like to, to go through the, the course overview now? To, to, so uh, a short introduction on the pollution and, and environmental course online. Yeah, um, sure. So um, that, that was a kind of example of the, the material that we teach. Very much, um, I teach quite a lot of modeling. I'm a hydrologist and modeler. But let's talk about uh, the course overview. So uh, we've got a great course, or, uh, an online course. Let me just, uh, whoops, go back. So this is uh, the online version of a very established uh, existing uh, master's course called Pollution and Environmental Control, which is uh, uh, very established and it's the oldest MSc course in the UK. We've designed it uh, to have high quality content. Hopefully you've seen the type of uh, quality that we uh, provide. Um, we built in flexibility for you to do this online in your own time at your own pace. So it's 100% online. Uh, you have the option of doing it full time and you, you, you work in parallel with our on-campus on uh, teaching or you can do it in uh, part time. So the full time is 12 months, part time is um, over, over a variety, two years, three years or, or, or up to 60 months. Um, as I said, it's the longest uh, running uh, MSc course in the UK. The next intake is September. So uh, about to go into that. So on, on screen here, you can see all the, uh, all the team, the, the, the academics who teach on, on, on the course. So I'm the course director. And then we have a, a variety of um, staff who, academic staff who teach the other courses. And I'll show you those courses in a moment. But our real focus, uh, certainly on my courses and on on other courses is, is to use real life case studies. So we, we try and embed our teaching in, in the real world, trying to uh, um, uh, build in employability. So very much a focus on real world application, real world data, real world case studies. Um, online students will have the uh, opportunity to undertake virtual field trips as well. We've designed um, some virtual field trips to, to take you into the, into the Peak District in the UK and other places to show you, show you around those. Um, so we, we, we have a lot of courses and then you'll do a research project. And those research projects, 
integrate everything you've learned on, on the course. So we've designed them so, so they're very relevant to the taught material. And they're very practical. So we're trying to, again, embed this real world application and practical experience to give you some good exposure. But uh, we've got some excellent academics uh, on teaching you. Okay, so um, as I've said, you can choose full time, part time, you can set your own schedules. Uh, the online content is available you to you uh, 24, uh, 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, so you can design your own um, work plans, library access, and um, you'll have uh, uh, access to a varied amount of online context. So on the screen there is, is some of that. So how you'll study. How you'll study, okay, so we've got examples there of um, a 12 month uh, full-time student. So you can see first semester, you'll do the um, one to four courses and then semester two, five to eight. And then finally, over the summer months, you'll undertake your research project. Again, if you uh, an example on there for the part-time study over 27 months, um, the, uh, uh, you would take less courses per semester and you could design it um, uh, as it's shown on screen there. And we've got a very good brochure that uh, we can send to you that also outlines how how these uh, full time and part time uh, study options um, are arranged. Okay, so just about the courses. So we've got uh, semester one. If you're doing it full time, or if you're doing part time, you choose uh, one or two of these courses to run alongside our on campus uh, students. We've got measuring and predicting. We've got measuring and predicting too. So we're focusing very much on how we measure data, analyze it how we use it in the atmosphere and in the hydrosphere, so looking at rivers and the atmosphere, undertaking some modeling, looking at the human impacts, so looking at pollution impacts on the biosphere, so how, how pollution impacts on, on the environment. And then my course, Pollution Management in Practice One, we start using some of the, the, the modeling that I briefly introduced today, and we're using real world examples for, for that course. Semester two, we build on semester one courses. So we start learning more about pollution mobility, transformation. Um, then I start teaching more about uh, uh, environmental measurement and modeling. And we, we do a lot of um, uh, computer modeling of, of real world uh, issues to do with pollution. This may be water quality modeling in, in Ethiopia to urban quality modeling in, in the city of Manchester. So uh, there's, there's hardcore pollution, mobility and transformation, so more chemistry. And then I'm dealing with how we can use models to replicate and solve pollution problems. During this semester, you'll be undertaking MSc tutorials and those are trying to prepare you or will prepare you for your research project. If you're on the full-time program in semester three, you'll undertake a, a research project that's based on two topics, water and air pollution, and um, you'll undertake those projects over the summer period if you're full-time, over a longer period if you're part-time. And you'll be undertaking virtual labs, virtual field work, conducting um, uh, computer modeling, advanced computer modeling or data science, depending on, on which topic you were, you were choosing, either the water project in the, in the Peak District or looking at air pollution in Manchester. So that's the kind of how we study, what we'll study, how do we support you? Well, there's a, a virtual learning environment. So we have something called Blackboard where all the material, learning materials are, um, are stored and you've got access to videos, uh, lecture slides, um, all the, the, the assessments. We give you personal support through tutorials, through, um, we, we give you an academic advisor. So there's, there's support on campus for wellbeing. There's access to career service, library services, and the student hubs for, for queries about um, uh, the nuts and bolts of, of, of studying at the university. So, yes, we, we have a question. So the first question would be, so do you require knowledge of coding uh, for, for modeling? And for example, knowledge of Python? Very good question. So for the modeling that I do, 
Um, no, you don't need Python. So I, I, I tend to teach um, bespoke software that's used in industry. So again, increasing your employability skills if you wanted to continue in industry. So I, I tend to teach you know, software packages and how we can use them for solving environmental problems. However, in the first semester, um, Paul Conley, Professor Paul Conley teaches uh, measuring and predicting number two, and it's about atmospheric modeling. And he introduces a little bit of Python uh, in his course. So there's a, in the first semester, you can, you will learn a very basic Python. Now, so, so yes, there's a little bit of Python. When you come to your research projects, then there's two, there's two streams. You can work with me on, on water projects and we use um, uh, software packages to, to look at um, modeling and predicting runoff from, from catchments in English countryside in, in the Peak District, these mountainous areas near Manchester. Or if you really want to do Python and a lot of Python, uh, then you can choose the air pollution research project, which is more, which is data science, um, uh, machine learning, and a lot of Python scripting. So you have the choice. So if, if you if you're comfortable with Python, we've got a got a way of of doing more. If you're not comfortable with Python, you don't want to do it. You can you can uh, work with uh, modeling using bespoke uh, software. Uh, uh, packages that I use on my courses. Great, thank you. And maybe you can tell what 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 softwares will students use over the, the course of the master? Yeah. So if you if you're working with me, then um, I'll be the, the 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 short lecture I gave today is using something I said Weep. That's the water evaluation and planning software. That is um, a very popular and widespread water balance modeling software. It's used. In developing countries because it's uh, free free to use in those countries and I, I, I worked with the Ethiopian government uh, building wheat models for for different parts of the country so that's quite a standard water resource modeling package. I also use something called flood modeler that is very versatile flood risk modeling package so we do 1D modeling 2D modeling looking at uh, flood risk and um, drainage networks in cities. So urban drainage network modeling in cities using Flood Modeler. Now Flood Modeler is, um, uh, in it, certainly in the UK, it's the industry standard for consultancy companies looking at um, uh, water movement and catchments. I use it also for 2D modeling, predicting water through mountainous areas, looking at uh, natural flood management, uh, nature-based solution in uh, green, techno <clears throat> green technology in urban areas. So I teach quite a bit about how we can reduce uh, flooding in cities using um, planting trees, nature-based solutions to, to slow the flow and reduce flooding in cities. So we use 2D modeling and flood modeler package. Uh, that's also used around the world internationally. Um, I also teach um, uh, the uh, uh, GIS, so we teach, I teach QGIS, quantum GIS, because that's used again, it's a free software that's used uh, in industry. We, we've also got access to Arc Pro, if you prefer to use that. Um, I also teach uh, SWIM, which is a, a water quality, uh, a stormwater management software so to look at um, uh, modeling uh, urban areas, urban drainage, but also looking at the water quality of that. Uh, and a whole host of other stuff. I, 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 I forget them all. But it's uh, you get a you get a good lot of modelling from me anyway. Good, <laughs> thank you. I have a, another question, quite specific but very interesting. So, uh, someone asking: Do you have case studies that pertain to small island developing states, for example, the Caribbean islands and mangrove areas? Um. In a word, no. So certainly don't have any mangrove um, uh, case studies. Um, so on small islands, well, I think the modeling that we apply would also apply to, to small, small, uh, small islands as well in the Caribbean. So much of what I teach you could, I think, um, you could use in a, in a Caribbean setting. Now, I'm just, as I'm talking, I'm thinking about Paul Conley's course in the first semester is measuring and predicting two. 
Now he does some atmospheric modeling where he's looking at the development of, I think it's rain shadow. So looking at how, how rainfall falls in a mountain area and then uh, um, using Python. Um, and then deposits rain rain on the on the leading edge of a mountain and the rain shadow on the the other and that's I think I may be wrong here but I think the case study is for Tenerife which is a, an, a small island in the Mediterranean so his course may look at islands from from my knowledge but um, not mangroves um, but certainly the ten techniques you learn could be could be applied. Um, or in in many countries including the caribbean great thank you thank you andrew and and certainly flood modeler for my consultancy work um work was done in nevis on a on an island called nevis um and that was using flood modeler for flood um uh, flood protection uh, work great Thank you. Um, I've got another question regarding the entry requirements. Um, so what are the entry requirements? What are the profiles of the, the students following the course? Entry requirements, uh, correct me if I'm not wrong, Xavier, but uh, <laughs> a, a, good, a good degree. So a, a 2-1 degree in science. So, yeah. but that, that's quite a broad subject range. So uh, geography, environmental science, um, engineering, uh, forestry. Uh, there's many. You know, we look at we look at a range of. A lot of students come to us on on campus from a range of uh, different backgrounds, uh, from different degrees. So a science background, but a good two one uh, degree, which is the English um, uh, degree standard. Yes. And uh, so, yes, uh, we also mentioned, and I will um, refer to the, to the web page where you will find, you, you will be able to find lots of information there, is that if you do not have a, an upper second class honors degree, uh, but have relevant work experience, you might be considered, so. Absolutely, yes, I forgot to mention that, yes. So you may, you may not have, uh, your background may be, uh, uh, career orientated so we also consider students uh, with uh, maybe not a 2-1 but with you know, excellent work experience we'd also consider that uh, work experience would have to be related but we would consider candidates um, on that basis. Yeah um, I also have a question regarding the, um, the, the assessments how are the units assessed? The assessments, okay, um, they vary. So we have um, uh, a varying between coursework and exams. So for instance, in semester one, the measuring predicting one and measuring predicting two, they're purely by examination. Um, however, my course in semester one um, is 100% coursework and that would involve producing a technical report based on the modeling exercises we do related to an environmental problem and a, a presentation, a group presentation. So mine's a coursework for the first term. The other two are 100% examination. John's course, which is looking at human impacts on the biosphere, is combination of coursework and examinations. In the semester two, uh, the lecture courses are all um, examinations. But on my courses, they include some in-class tests. So you do some, you, you get a few marks before you turn up in the exam hall. Uh, for my courses, for the, the tutorials, that's uh, writing a research proposal. So that's 100% coursework. And of course, the summer project, the research project is 100% uh, based on the, the MSc thesis that you, that you write. So it's a combination of coursework report writing, thesis writing, examinations, and some in-class tests. Good, thanks. Um, I've got um, another question regarding the software you mentioned for flood modeling. Um, are they also capable of modeling storm surge? Uh, yes. Uh, um, good question. 
We can certainly deal with tides. So we, we, we can put down on our downstream boundary on 1D models and 2D models, tidal boundaries. And we can, we can put in a, a tidal surge. Uh, we, could, we could build a, a 2D model to represent, uh, I've done that before actually in, in industry. We can use 2D modeling in, in uh, Flood Modeler and apply a surge to, to that, to that um, to look at the inundation of coastlines. In terms of surges itself, I'd have to get back to you on that. I'm not tied to not my specialty. Oh, I will write the name of the person. But, but certainly, if, you, if the question is about mangroves uh, and storm yeah. surges, we can certainly model. Uh, if we had high resolution digital terrain models um, of a coastline, uh, we could model that in 2D and apply a storm surge to it. Yeah. Okay. I've done that in Lagos, actually. I had an MSc student who was interested in looking at. Um, Evacuation plans. He was in the military. He's looking at evacuation plans in Lagos. If uh, sea levels rise and there's a storm surge, and we looked at which roads were being blocked, when, for how long, for what depth, to see if uh, emergency workers could get through various routes to communities. So we can, right. we can do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got uh, also a question here. It's um, are students able to communicate with other students during the studies? Are they encouraged to do that and how that happens? Yeah, we've, we've talked about that. Yes. So um, on a day to day level, there's discussion boards so you can interact uh, and, and help each other with answer questions on a, on a discussion board. And the academic staff can also contribute to that. Uh, we do have um, we, we plan to set up a kind of virtual classroom. So that's open all the time so that uh, students can drop in, see who's there, uh, hang out, work together, maybe offline, uh, online. Uh, so you can meet students that way. We plan to have some online sessions to, um, what do we call them? Uh, icebreaker sessions to, to, to get to know you. Uh, and hopefully you can, you can get to know your, your fellow students. There'll be online tutorials. So an opportunity to, to work in small groups with uh, probably me or um, another member of staff, and you'll get to know your, your other um, distance learning students, online students through, through small group work as well. So there's, there's quite a lot of opportunity to do that. And we encourage it, we want that to happen. Great, thank you. And I've got a last question for the moment. Um, how many hours per week would you recommend to spend in the study? Ah, uh, um, it depends on if you're full-time or part-time. Mm -hmm. So if you're full-time, uh, so uh, the, I'm just thinking of the on-campus students. So we would expect uh, kind of a nine to five, 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. If you're part time, of course, that's much less and you may be balancing your own careers, uh, your own business or, or child care or, or, or um, um, your life, you know, so we, we would expect so if you're, if you're trying to do it in 27 months, it'd be between uh, 10 and 15 hours a week. But, but, but that's, you know, uh, so a lot of that is independent work. So, um, for instance, if you're taking my one course in semester one, you would have probably two hours, three hours of actually looking at videos and lectures, uh, thinking about the work. Uh, so maybe maybe three or four hours actual working with the virtual learning environments, and then three or four hours just uh, progressing the practical work and thinking about and reading about uh, the su the subject that week. So it depends on what part time you you go. If you're a full time student, the on campus students are expected to work forty hours a week. Um, so hopefully Great. that helps. Yeah. Well, thank you. But, but that forty hours yeah. is is you know a lot of independent work as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't have any more questions for the moment, so I, we arrive at the end of the the event. I would like to thank you all for your participation. Thank you very much, Andrew, for the lecture and for all the information about the online pollution and environmental control online course. 
I think that's been really useful for uh, people watching uh, uh, today and people watching back. So I will just launch a, a quick poll to our attendees. Um, so please feel free to fill that in. If you would like to arrange a consultation, do not hesitate to select yes, and I will send you a note and we can talk on Zoom or over the phone at a moment that is convenient for you. The application uh, are now open for the next intake in September, as Andrew mentioned it. So to secure your place on the course, I strongly recommend that you apply sooner than, rather than later. And feel free to get in touch about uh, how to apply or if you have any other question. As I said, you, you can email me at any time at studyonline at manchester.ac.uk. I'll be happy to help. So, we will finish here for today. So thank you all for your participation and we hope to see you starting the course uh, soon with us. Thank you, Great. bye. Thank you very much, bye-bye.